For more information on that new dog, visit adoptuskids.org, a public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Services, adoptuskids, and the Ad Council. The possibility of lung cancer can be pretty scary, especially if you're one of approximately 8 million current or former smokers at high risk. That's why SaveByTheScan.org wants you to know that now there's a breakthrough low-dose CT scan that can detect lung cancer early, and it only takes 60 seconds. You stop smoking, now start screaming. For an easy quiz to see if you're eligible, visit SaveByTheScan.org. It could save your life. SaveByTheScan.org is brought to you by the American Lung Association's Lung Force Initiative at the Ad Council. There we go. again for my listeners, my supporters, um, just everybody in this entire country. I'm honored to have in the studio today Miss Bennett. Um, she has a book called No Dreams Left Behind. Very powerful, very dynamic young lady doing great things. Uh, we're going to get into her story in just a minute. And we're also waiting on um, another one of my dynamite guests, the, the Grace our presence. But um, I want to first just talk to the masses about self-control, respect, and just, you know, so from a respect piece, I had a conversation with someone yesterday about respect. And we often talk about respecting someone else, you know, someone should respect somebody and this and that other, but you actually have to start off by respecting yourself. Respecting yourself is, is simply this. If you believe in the greater good of man, God, yourself, and you want to make sure that your actions are demonstrating some positive energy or giving off some positive messages to others, that's one way of respecting yourself. First of all, respect comes from a place where you have to care about yourself. I know there, there are some people that are dealing with mental issues or there are some people that went through a lot of things in their lives and they're kind of not really, they don't, know where they, they don't know where to go or how to start their lives or how to recover from a situation or how to communicate with someone. You know, there are a lot of people out here that are just stuck. But how do you prevent from being stuck? Like I said, once again, you have to respect yourself first. Respect yourself and respect others. A another form of respect is actually minding your business. <laughs> if you mind your business, that's a, that's a sign of respect. If I'm making sense. A lot of us lose respect. A lot of people, we lose respect and gain respect based off of what we say and what we do. And then a lot of times, we know our actions are wrong because everyone knows right from wrong. But people still decide to do the wrong in hopes of uh, recovering from it or they have a hidden agenda or at that point in their lives, they just don't care. They're just acting out of, I don't care. And we have to get out of that space as well that you don't care. You, we, we all care about something. Even if you don't care about yourself, you care about something. That's another proponent of respect. So... Without further ado, I'm going to introduce my guest, 
Miss Sharnita Bennett. If you can tell my listeners who you are, so they can get so they can get acquainted with you, so this program can be a heartfelt and very warming dialogue. How are you doing, Miss Bennett? I'm doing great. Um, again, I'm Sharnetta Bennett, and basically, I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor of a lot of things, but I was um, raised, born and raised in Washington D.C. I'm 42 years old. Um, I'm an author. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a motivational speaker. Um, I've been through a lot of things in life, and the things that I've been through has pushed me into my purpose. It pushed me, you know, out there into the unknown to do things that I never thought or never dreamed that I would ever be able to do, and that's to help other women to overcome the obstacles that they've gone through or dealing with currently and just to push themselves into purpose. So that's basically who I am. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going we're going to get right right into it. Um, so your first your first chapter in your book, when all hope is gone, fight. That's that's very powerful in itself. A lot of a lot of people, and you can actually you know piggyback on this. A lot of people give up the fight in a lot of cases before the fight even start. From a mental standpoint, uh, what are some of your suggestions on, you know, when you're in the midst of a fight? You know, how did you actually come through? Or what, what motivates you you to not stop? You just wanted to keep, you know, pressing on. Um, what motivated me was I've always been like a dreamer. I've always dreamed big. I've always, like, sat down and just zoned out and saw myself in places, you know, that I wanted to be in my life. And to be honest, it was not easy because the things that I went through was so detrimental that I really wanted to give up, and I almost gave up. I even... Um, had thoughts of suicide, you know, it had gotten that bad, but I kept pushing. I just kept hearing that voice in the back of my head that dream, your dream, still dream, keep going, keep fighting, keep pushing, you know, don't lose hope because mm -hmm. if you lose hope, you're just going to lay down and die. You're not going to achieve the things that you want to achieve in life. And me, I know everybody's not a spiritual person, but I am a spiritual person, so I've always kept God at the head of everything I've been through. So I knew what God had promised me. I knew that this was not what God had for my life. I knew the things that I was going through was not what God had for my life. I knew that there was a bigger plan. I knew there was a purpose in what I was going through. And I always tell people, if you survived your storm, if you go through the storm and you survive and you didn't die in it, then there's, there's a greater purpose. The things that you've gone through is always mostly probably about 90 percent of the times that's your purpose in life sometimes you have to go through those things even though it might hurt even though you might cry even though you know it feels bad at the time but you have to go to go through those things because it's conditioning you and it's getting you prepared for your next level and where it is that you need to be in life all right you said something that's very uh near and dear to my heart and a lot of people don't you have to be in tune with yourself and we're talking about coming from a place when that I don't know what it is when your other mind is telling you to do something. So if you can, can you can you let my my um, listeners understand what's your breakdown of having an actual dialogue with that something? We all have that something that's telling us to quit. We all have that something that's telling us that we're nothing but failures. We all have that. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a, a daily conversation. And I really believe, Miss Bennett, that a lot of people are not even in tune with that other being in their minds. Um, that that's very very true. Um, a lot of people do go through that, especially when we're going through hard times and rough times. But that's when um, affirmation should kick in because mm -hmm. that's just a dialogue with yourself, letting yourself know that you are worth it, that you are more than enough, that you are a conqueror, that you can overcome any obstacles that you're facing. So that's what I had to do. I had to condition my mind, and that's the. I have a part in the book where I talk about positioning myself. So I had to um, reposition my mind, my thought pattern, the way I thought. Because like I said, I wanted to kill myself. It had got that bad. Like I really wanted to take something and just lay down and die. And mm -hmm. I actually tried to do that. But I kept hearing those voices in the back of my head to tell me to keep pushing, to keep right. pushing. So every day when I woke up, I would look myself in the mirror. And as bad as life was at that time, I would tell myself, you are worth it. You are more than enough. You are a conqueror. You will achieve those things that you set out to achieve. So speaking those daily and those positive affirmations in your life, they really do work and they really do help. Um, stop looking at your situation as a situation. Just look at your situation as I'm going through this. 
because it's, there's a greater purpose on the other side. I'm going through this because there's somebody else out there who's not as strong as me mm -hmm. that cannot go through what I'm going through and make it. If they go through what I go through, they might end up killing themselves or they might die in their mess. So what you're going through is for a purpose to help somebody else out. So every day I had to push myself. I had to push myself. Keep having that daily talk with myself that I'm more than enough, that I'm more than a conqueror. And I had to believe those things in myself even though I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. And that's when my faith kicked in because I did not see it. I honestly did not see it. I was homeless. I didn't see myself um, you know making it out of that situation. But I, was, I would literally sit down and zone out. And I saw myself in my own place. I saw myself in a furnished place. I saw myself working again. I saw myself with bank, bank accounts. I had to literally see myself and think myself out of my situation. When, when all hope is gone, fight. I, um, I, I want to attack this from this standpoint. No matter what, no matter where you are in your life, whether you're successful, whether you're into a mental depression state, whether you are going through something in the midst of, we have to always train our minds to fight. Fighting is also a sign of faith. Fighting is also a sign of you realizing that you are a child of God, and no matter what your flesh is telling you to do now, you still have to put it on your mind that I'm going to fight no matter what. What I've, what I've learned dealing with just different people People don't even have the conversation about fighting. Like on my radio shows, Ms. Ben, I always talk about the healthy conversations that people should have. Like the conversation that you are, you and I are having now, these should be conversations that people should be having with other people on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. We all know that testimonies are is almost equated to reading Bible scriptures. Mm -hmm. An actual testimony is something that actually happened. So it's not like you, um, you're you making up a story. And that's why people can look at TV, and I'm changing gears here, but I'm trying to get my point so that everybody listening can understand it. People will look at a television show, and they will retain everything that happened in the show. And they'll go the next day and tell their girlfriends or, or the dudes will talk about you know what happened in that, in that basketball game, what happened in that show. What I'm realizing is even at work, People always talk about negative things, but they're not having the conversations to bring solutions on why they were in this situation. You get more so like, girl, yeah, I wouldn't even deal with that. I wouldn't deal with him. Or the dudes be like, man, he such and such and such and such. So what we don't realize is that we're having continual unhealthy conversations. And those unhealthy conversations get trickled down to our kids. And it trickles down into their education. And like you, like you said, you was on the brink of ending it all. But you had the where for all to say, hey, look, I'm better than this. So what, what can you tell a young lady that's pretty much at the end of her road, man? What, what advice can you give her? I can let her know that she's worth it. Like I said before, you're more than enough. Your mm -hmm. natural situations, your natural circumstances, your natural problem, you are more than enough. You have to keep pushing. You have to keep fighting. If you give up, that's the easy way out mm -hmm. is to give up. But to fight is where you have to have that faith. That you have to have that trust in God. And I keep bringing it back to God because that's my only source. That's all I know. If it that's wasn't for Him, that. <laughs> that, that's, my, that's my source for survival. So um, that's why I keep bringing it back to Him. But you can't give up because there's somebody else out there. There's another young lady that's out there mm -hmm. that's on the verge of giving up. And it's your story and it's your testimony that's going to save her life. So you have to go through what you're going through to help somebody else even though it's gonna hurt you know it's that, that's a, a very wow I always get I get choked up in my shows because a lot of cases we once again people listen to shows and I guess everybody's waiting for something to touch them mm -hmm. but in reality when a person is speaking they're speaking from their heart you should try to actually capture everything that they're saying because if they weren't listening you went from a person that was homeless abused, um, wanted to, to take your life away, but yet you still had it on your heart to write a book to bring change to other people. If if a small percentage of society live their lives, I'm talking a small percentage, live their lives to help other people, the world would start being in a better place. If we start teaching our, our young kids how to, and when we were coming up, they actually taught us that, you know, be nice, be respectful, say thank you, no ma'am, yes sir, and all that. And 
and I know I'm kind of bouncing over because a lot of my a lot of our listeners, um, Miss Bennett, they don't people are in denial, mm -hmm. so I have to I have to find a way to <laughs> make it make sense and to capture the mindset so that people can can understand what we're saying. When all hope is gone, fight. You have to fight for your marriages. You have to fight for your kids. You have to fight for your sales. You have to fight for your 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 best friend is going through something. It's it's a it's a joint effort. A lot of people aren't able to fight alone because they don't even know how to begin to fight. You know, it's it's so easy to give up. Mm -hmm. But when you if you think if you think that I'm going to be a survivor, and you tell yourself this every day, this like for instance, if someone say to themselves they wake up every morning, I'm going to fight for this. I'm going to fight for my marriage. I'm going to fight for my mom. I'm going to fight for my child. If you just wake up every morning and say that I'm going to fight for something, then your mind will start to process that. We always say people are one paycheck away from being homeless. We also say in relationships, um, one individual is one frustrational moment from committing domestic violence. So we all have to be in tune with one another's actions. So we're gonna we're gonna skip to keep the faith and trust. What does that mean to you, Ms. Bennett? Um, like I said before, keeping your faith, trust in God, believing that this is not the end of you. Mm -hmm. Everything around me, everything in my life was telling me, Sharnetta, this is the end of you. Like literally, this is the end of you. But I had to go back to that promise that God had made me several years before that He would never leave me or He would never forsake me. So I had to believe that. And I had to take the little bit of faith that I had, and I had to use that faith, activate that faith, and work it to the best of my ability. I had, I, I didn't have a job. I didn't have any money, but I had to trust God through that process. I had to trust God when I didn't have. I had to trust God when I was sleeping on somebody's floor for two years. I had to trust God when I was begging people for money to pay my cell phone bill or to eat. I've never been in that space before ever in my life, but I still had to trust God because God made me a promise and I believe what he promised me. So they say have the faith of the size of a mustard seed, which is very, very tiny. You only need a little, a little tiny bit. bit of faith. And that's not hard to, tr and that's, and once again, that's not hard to trust. If it's The world is set up for our journeys not to be hard. It's that we as human beings, we make our journeys mm -hmm. hard. Um, faith is small as a mustard seed. It's, it's funny that you say that because every day I, I live that because I do believe in God. Um, I, um, I pray every night. Um, when I'm in a situation, I actually have a conversation with him. And, and we tell people this all the time. You have to believe in something. If you don't believe in something um, spiritually, you have to believe in a, a family member or someone, or someone that's doing something positive in your life. But you can't go into this world thinking it's just you. Because if you live thinking it's just you, then you're going to affect a whole bunch of other people in a negative way because you can't help but be selfish. So the faith and the trust part comes in. You have to trust something. We, no, I don't think anyone wakes up every morning and saying that they just want to have a bad life or have a bad day or they just want to do something bad to someone. It comes from a place of something took place in your life that there was no one there to help you through it. So what you're saying is very powerful the salvation is in yourself. You have to actually get your mind right for yourself to be a better person. So if you can, what are some of the things that that you've actually gone through in your life that got you to the point of, I'm going to help as many women as I possibly can help? Um, starting off, I began um, going through domestic violence. And I began that in high school, in my 12th grade year of high school. And... You know, during that time, I was a teenager. I was 16 years old, and I thought that that was love, and I thought that he cared about me because, you know, the control and all that stuff like that, which I didn't know control was one of the major real warnings, um, the warning signs for domestic violence. And once I, uh, I went through that for almost eight years, almost eight wow. years, and I literally thought that I was going to die in that. I literally didn't think I was going to make it out. And I was, I've always been a church girl. I've always been into church. Mm -hmm. And I used to pray. I remember I used to pray to God and I used to ask God to, to 
I couldn't do it myself. I could not just walk away because it wasn't that easy for me to walk away from him. He always would threaten me, it's either you or me, or it's both. And I believed him. And um, I always would pray to God, and I'm like, God, I don't know how to, you know, get away from this. I was so embarrassed. I wouldn't tell my friends. I didn't tell my family, of course. And I used to say God would allow some. I'd ask God to really have someone to kill this person because that's the only way that I knew how to get out. And I was so afraid of hurting my mother because I believed if I stayed in it any longer that I would die in this. And I was afraid of my mother, you know, hurting from my death. Mm -hmm. So um, he got locked up eventually, um, which was a good thing. But he got locked up on a murder charge, and I just... Like, wow. God, thank you, because that could have could've been, been me. Yeah. You know, that could have been me. And I um, I went through that. And once I came out of that, domestic violence is a vicious, vicious cycle because I met another person who was totally the opposite, very good to me. But my mindset at that time was so screwed up from what I had gone through for right. all those years that I thought this was too good to be true. So I turned the abuser. I didn't physically abuse him, but mentally and verbally I tore him to pieces. Mm -hmm. And so I pushed him out of the door. And that's when a red flag went off in my head, like, this is wrong. This is not right. I have to begin to break the cycle. And that's when I started my first um, organization, which was the Hope Foundation, which was an acronym for helping other people escape. And I just wanted to help other women because a lot of people was going through domestic violence but nobody was talking about it at that time. And when I first came out with my story in my church, I found out a lot of women in the church was going through the same thing, but it took for me, you know, to go through it. And it took for me to come out and share my story, you know, that gave them the courage to come out and talk about theirs. So I started helping other women that way. I started um, doing group sessions. We would come together, you know, and share our stories about mm -hmm. abuse and just be a support system for each other so I, I went on um you know on for years doing that mm -hmm. if if you are my listeners if you can call in and um speak to if you know someone that's been through domestic violence or if you've been through domestic violence and you have a solution or advice or some type of encouraging words to help someone because we we know it's a very it's a very delicate topic um and a lot of people don't speak out about it because they come from a place that they don't want to actually revisit their their you know their their um, actions when it when it took place. So please call in 800-450-7876, 800-450-7876. If you have been involved or know of someone that has been involved, because we're trying to actually uplift and help people as much as we can. So from a from a male point of a male standpoint. And by no means, um, you know, am, am I encouraging anything? What, what, what from a from a male? And you, and you, you actually said it um, based off of the situation you went through, when you had another opportunity with another uh, companion, that because of what you went through, you kind of pushed that other person away. Okay, so a lot of people go through those situations, and not even just in domestic violence situations, but just in. Just something went wrong, whether it be cheating, whether it be, um, you know, bills, whether it be, you, you name it. We, we find our place taking something out on someone else that doesn't deserve for that to happen to. So my point I'm making, we have to we have to come up with and I and I'm, I'm I want to commend you for being a strong, powerful woman to even spread the word to share your story, because that's that is not easy to do. But the main component you have, you do have God on your side. And, and with that alone, you can go a long, a long way in life and you are able to share your story. I want to speak to, how do, how do you, tell me, actually tell our listeners, what can, what can a, a young lady, who, can a, who, who do you know to trust? Because a lot of people out here want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of tell my listeners or who the person that you think you can trust in other than talking to God? What are some of the people based off of the conversation that you've had with people going through your situation, it's like, okay, this is a person I probably can trust. Or do you go through and be like, hey, I'm going to keep this to myself. And then one day, of course, you came out and wrote a book. But prior to the book and prior to you wanting to bring individual personal change, what were some of the key components that you sought out for for people that you can actually talk to? Um, well, with my situation, personally, I didn't talk to anybody because, like I said, it was an embarrassment to me mm -hmm. um, to go through the things that I went through. I didn't want to tell my friends. I didn't want to tell my family. I eventually told my friends once I came out about it. Um, but 
and back then it, there wasn't a lot of resources. Nobody talked about it. It was mm-hmm. kept hush hush for some reason. So I, what I would say to a person now is find that person that you know you can trust. Talk to your family members. Talk to your close friends. Talk to somebody, mm-hmm. uh, or get on a, get online, research, Google. It's a lot of support groups out of he, out here. Um, there's that one eight hundred number, the hotline numbers. Like talk to somebody. Just don't go through. Don't suffer in silence because you can end up losing your life by suffering in silence. Let somebody know and. A lot of these domestic violence cases, you can't just get up and leave. You have to come up with a plan to escape. So talk to somebody that you know that you can trust that can help you out of this situation. So at the people that you've come in contact with in your walk and your, um, you know, with your your book and things, how often do you come across young adults um, that talk about domestic violence? Um. Like I said, when I first came out, I came across a lot of people who talked about domestic violence. Um, as I, as I, you know, went through my journey, I've met a lot of people. You know, once I say, because I'm, I'm an open book. I'm very transparent about the things I've gone through. And once I start sharing my story with, you know, with people just in passing or just meeting a person, and I might, you know, talk about domestic violence, and then they'll come out and they'll say something. So I've have met a lot of people that have gone through domestic violence. Just looking at them, you would have never thought. That they've mm-hmm. been through that or even dealing with it at the time. Um, but I've met so many women um, because we mistake love. Um, That's a key component. Yeah, we, mistake, we mistake the things that these men do, and not just men because it's in the uh, gay community as well, but we mm-hmm. mistake certain things for love. Like I said, I thought that him buying me everything, I thought that him controlling where I went, like he wanted to know my every move, he wanted to know what I was wearing. I thought things like that was love. Right. And it really was not love. It was a sign that I should have been running like hell. We 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 oftentimes and and uh, there are a lot of people are guilty of um knowing that their their family member or knowing that their mate is going through something and they turn a deaf ear to it. What, what, is, what are some of the things you can tell, you know, my listeners that if you know somebody is going through something, what was some of the key things or key discussions that someone had with you to actually bring you comfort going through what you was going through? Um, my self-esteem was very, very low. So just someone boosting my self-esteem up, a lot, telling me that I'm beautiful, you know, telling me that I don't deserve what I'm going through. Just somebody just encouraging me. We sometimes we need that person to encourage us. You know, to let us know because we would start believing these things that these people tell us, our abusers tell us. They tell mm-hmm. us we're not worth it. We tell they tell us that we won't make it without them. They tell us all these type of crazy things and we believe that. We condition our minds to believe those things about ourselves. But if you have somebody that you know that truly loves you, um, like your family member or your close friends or someone in your church or where you work, they you know that they truly have your best interests at heart. If they encourage you, you know, push you, then I believe that that's, that will give you strength, you know, to at least take the steps to move past that abusive relationship. And another thing, too, that um, that people have to realize, coming from a place of comfort and coming from, some people get comfortable in those bad situations. They almost get immune to the fact of they know what they're going through, but like you said, they come from a place of low self-esteem or they come from a place of what am my peers going to say? What do, you, what do you say to the couples that go out here and they paint this picture that they're doing great things, but knowing and you know, but knowing when they get home, it's terrible. And I was that person. Not even in that relationship. I was choosing the same type of men. You know, like I said, when I got oh, past that relationship, I went into another one and I started being the abuser and then but I was still it was still something going on with inside me that I needed to attack, that I needed to capture what was going on inside of me because I was still choosing those type of men. Um, I chose a man that he wasn't abusive, you know, far as physical, but he was a womanizer. Mm-hmm. And I stayed in that relationship for almost 11 years. And I painted this picture on the outside and everybody seen it but me. Mm-hmm. Everybody told me that this man is no good for you. Everybody seen the signs, but I was so blinded by what I thought was love. And I stayed in it for 11 years and I painted this picture like everything was perfect mm-hmm. on the inside and on the it wasn't. It was a mess. And I was really dying on the inside. And this 
That relationship is what left me homeless. That relationship is what left my bank account in the negative. Okay. That relationship is what took me through hell. You know, but I painted this picture and everybody was telling me to stay away from him. And I was getting mad at these people who were telling me to stay away. Right. I, so, well, wow. We, we're gonna, um, we are going to take a break and we're going to come back um, with Miss Bennett. Um, very powerful dialogue. Um, it's very important conversation. And we're actually going to talk about that putting on fronts and, you know, faking like everything is cool because actually it's killing you on the inside when you do that. Mm -hmm. This is the Archie Bezlow Show. Let's figure it out on WO95.9 FM, 1450 AM. We'll be right back. Thank you. Facebook, so we're still here in the studio with Miss Bennett. Just, I can't hear you. Worldwide. WOLDCnews.com. Why should you volunteer with Meals on Wheels? I'll come to the door with one meal and I'll walk away with a full heart. Drop off a warm meal and get more than you expect. Are you still expecting another guest? America, yeah, 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 she she she's downstairs. Down she's downstairs. Down 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 I'm putting like. When someone hears the words, you have cancer. It's one of the darkest moments in their life. Light the Night brings light to the darkness of cancer by uniting survivors, patients, and supporters in the cause to end cancer. Friends, families, and coworkers form a community of hope, raising funds in support of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Together, we walk with lanterns held high to light the path to cures. Last year alone, the FDA approved 18 new drug therapies and treatments to treat blood cancers. The impact of LLS-supported research goes beyond blood cancer. The discoveries made in blood cancer research have led to breakthrough treatments for many cancers and other serious diseases. When we walk, cancer runs. Join the movement to end cancer today. Visit us at lightthenight.org. Gasoline prices are going through the roof. Tell me about it. I can't afford to drive to the grocery store. We've reached a tipping point. Okay. Yeah, and I've reached my coupon clipping point. So here's some can tips that can save you hundreds of dollars yeah. a year on gas and help the environment. Okay. Keep your tires properly inflated. I couldn't Don't speed mm -hmm. and avoid jackrabbit starts. Mm -hmm. Helpful tips like these could save you enough money to buy breakfast for a year. Sure. Wow. Visit the Alliance to Save Energy's website, www.drivesmarterchallenge.org. You hungry? Breakfast? Me? You? Huh? Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. Support for okay. your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. One time a man that walked in there to get his high school diploma. It was very hard for me, but Miss Sarah Sally, she gave me correction. At age 47, Michael finished his high school diploma. 50% of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors. The other 50% is doing the work. Alone. If you're thinking diploma you have help find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org that's finishyourdiploma.org brought to you by the dollar general literacy foundation and the ad council what is it mignon Alright, 
we're back. We're back. We're back on the Archie Bezlo Show. Let's figure it out. We're just joined in the studio by the phenomenal, dynamic, say your name, I don't want to mess it up. McYoung Brown Anderson. <laughs> McYoung Brown. So tell my, li my listeners a little bit about yourself. Well, I am a domestic violence survivor and also advocate. I am also the founder and president of the Lakeisha Brown Foundation. I started this organization 11 years ago when my daughter Lakeisha was murdered by her boyfriend at the age of 18. So, this, so since then, I have been bringing awareness and education to domestic violence while promoting self-love and healthy relationships. Wow. All right, well, wow. All right, well, let's... So I'm I'm the I'm the I'm a different type of host. I'm, I'm an emotional host. So mm -hmm. when I hear things, it, it touches my heart. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't downplay any because for people to give their time to come on my show to talk about something as as sensitive as what you guys are talking about, it's it's you you know why there are a lot of people in our country that are struggling so bad because in spite of people don't open up enough to talk about certain things. And I always talk, you never really recover from anything that major, mm -hmm. but you have to figure out how to start the healing process. Because if you don't, you will actually start to kill yourself. And and I really want to commend you ladies for actually giving your testimonies on what you guys have been through because it's so, it, the world just needs it. But when we took a break, we were talking about um, relationships, how people go out and about and they're putting on fronts as if they're in a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. But when they get home, there's a lot of abuse going on. Have you had conversations with people that are going through that? Absolutely. And even myself, I went through that in an abusive okay. marriage. So on the outside, we looked like we were that perfect couple. But when we went home, it was like the house of hell that right. I had to endure. And I always look back and try to ask myself, why did I endure it for so long? And it's because I had built him up. I had built him up to be this perfect person. So when the abuse started, it comes with a lot of shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want anybody saying, I told you so. You know, so I tried to cover it up, hoping that he would get better and change. That's so wow, and that's and that's another powerful component. When you're in a bad situation, the hope becomes like you're guiding. It's like every day, every well, every minute, every hour, every day, you're just hoping for change, hoping for change. And in a lot of cases, a lot of people don't make it because they put their their heart on hope. Mm -hmm. What is what are some of, the, some of the things that you can, in spite of everything you've gone through, to still have this strength? If you can tell my listeners, what make both of you guys so strong to still advocate for other people? Because I, I, it has to be tough. It is. It's very tough. And what keeps me motivated is because I don't want another mother to have to bury their daughter prematurely. Awesome. So just that alone keeps me going every day. It's nothing else that I can do for my daughter, but her legacy can live on to be able to help other young girls and women. Then do you still have connections with your daughter's friends? I mean, her, some of them I some do. Of them? Some okay. of them I do. Wow. I um, I I just I come from a place of solutions. I I just, I just think that we all, if we we know the right thing. So why don't we just do the right thing? Mm -hmm. And and Miss Bennett spoke about it. You know, we, we we a lot of times we spare people's feelings while we're still going through. Mm -hmm. So we have to actually teach people um, how does it how does it look or what are the actions that you have to do to just get out of something and stop worrying about what the next person is going to say about you because no matter what people say about you, they're going to still go on about their lives. Mm -hmm. But while you're still home suffering, so I, I need one of you guys to speak to. Telling people to just forget about what somebody is going to say about you. You have to control your own life. Absolutely. We have to stop people pleasing. A lot of times in life, people pleasing keeps us in places that become very detrimental to our health. And so what I tell people, what I try to teach teens now is that um, how do you help someone? How do you help the victim and the abuser? Because mm -hmm. there's no winners in this, and everybody needs to be um, helped. So how do you be that friend to someone that's going to, through abuse, and how do you be a friend to someone that's an abuser? Right. And first of all, with an abuser, you have to call out the behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too many times we yeah. sit back and we watch violent behavior, then we go home and talk about it amongst ourselves of how foolish the people look. 
instead of telling that person right then and there that this is abuse, it's not right, it's illegal, you can go to jail. You know, tell them what it is. And also with the victim, you have to continue to love the victim through mm -hmm. their situation because it becomes very psychological for the victim. And, and people have to stop downplaying it. And, and, and my listeners, I need you to follow me with this. We can be, people can be in any environment. You can be at a show, you can be in church, you can be at a club. But when someone bring up a, if you know one of your, your friends or whatever is going through something, don't downplay it. Girl, just, you can find you another dude anyway. Or girl, you can do this. We got to stop having those, those not making the conversation important. If your, if your girl's friend is going through something, or even if it's a guy that's going through it, mm -hmm. If you know right then and there, I don't care if you're at a show, if you're in a church or you're at a club, you need to walk that person outside because every minute counts. And we come from a place of thinking that what we're saying is a, and another thing. This is what our society do. We say nice things just because to validate ourselves, but we're not really caring about what the person is going through. Mm -hmm. Well, that has to change. Mm -hmm. If you really care, you're going to say, hey, look, we need to leave this environment. And you and I need to go somewhere and talk. Matter of fact, let's talk every Thursday, you and I. Mm -hmm. that's, that brings change. Absolutely. Because now that starts making a person realize, hey, I really do have somebody that really has my back. Mm -hmm. So I need you ladies to speak to what does having someone's back look like for the people that, that have people going through something. Give them proponents on how they can actually help their peers. Well, how you can help them for one, it would may it may take you to be the one to be able to get that safety plan for them. There you may go. have to search out where they can go, where they can get help, and just tell them, you know, you may need you may need an emergency bag. Pack it and leave it at my house. You know, I may have a a, a credit card that I could put to a side where I got money for you that when you leave you have somewhere decent to stay. So these are the components that we need because a lot of times women that I meet, you know, because we know that domestic violence affects everyone, you have someone coming from a $500,000 home and they don't want to go in a shelter. Wow. They don't want to do that. So we have to be able to provide other means for them. So that's what it means mm -hmm. to be a friend. Get your girlfriends together. If we can all get together and hang out and go drink, get together and put some money on the card for me where I can make, go stay in a hotel where I can be safe. Me my children. Come on now. And see, this this is the whole purpose why I set out to have my own radio show. Because there are all types of shows that do a lot of rhetoric. They just talk, 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 but not giving any solutions. At the end of the day, people need solutions. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even think, what you just said, I didn't even thought about, didn't even think about actually telling somebody to pack a bag, have a bag ready, um, have a credit card. That's what girlfriends should do. Mm -hmm. Because we can talk about all these TV shows and all these new trends and all that, but at the end of the day, the healthy conversation should be preparedness. Absolutely. Like we're preparing for destruction in the world. Mm -hmm. People need to prepare for their lives mm -hmm. and the things that they're going through. So in real talk, those conversations don't even have to take up the whole brunt of you guys being out. Say, hey, look, before we get into this show, or before we do this book reading club, or, hey, let's talk about now issues. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us are not talking about now issues until it's too late. That's right. So a question for you guys. Do you, are you guys associated with anyone that's going through domestic violence right now? And, and are you reaching them based off of what you guys been through? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, on my way here, someone had reached out to me about a woman that has been in a domestic violence um, relationship for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And she's trying to get out now. So we're going to have to be able to give her those resources to be able to get out. Okay. So it's very important to be connected to those resources if you know um, any other programs um, any other um, people mm -hmm. who may can um, help them in different ways like I said provide money I'm even trying to get some of these churches out here to be able to provide instead of them building another wing of the church to build something that would be able to be like a, um, a, a, a fallout shelter that for an emergency for two to three days I can put someone in a safe place until I get them more permanent place to go and the, the what people need to realize, domestic violence, do, domestic violence don't have a certain face. No. It's a situation. You can be with the nicest person in a split second. That person can actually flip the script and do something regretfully or even intentionally. That's why it is so important to, I say it all the time, to have daily conversations with your kids, even have conversations with your mate. So you can see where you guys really are. Mm -hmm. You can't take for granted. Even if you're going through a verbal and abusive relationship, 
at some point you say, hey, can we talk? And just have a conversation to see where that person is because that person will tell you that you need to get out, mm -hmm. out of this without them actually telling you this. Right. Because if your mate can't sit down and have a loving and enduring conversation with you, you got to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, and I know, Ms. Bennett, you had spoke on it about one relationship and another relationship because you were still connected to that bad relationship that this relationship got terminated. So, but all that comes from having the communication thing. People have to communicate, and we have to communicate about the worst things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us are afraid to have those bad conversations. Yeah, I know with me, um, I never had, like my mom, she never had that conversation with me. I didn't know anything about domestic violence. I didn't grow up in a household with domestic violence. I didn't see it. I didn't see it, um, so I didn't know anything about it. And... I, when I grown up, I was spoiled. I was my mother's only child, and she spoiled me. And a lot of people might look at that on the outside like, dang, she spoiled. That's a good thing she had if she has that. But it ruined me. It pushed me out there into a lifestyle that I was not prepared for. It pushed me out there into the hands of a drug dealer because he could provide for me the things that my mother was providing for me. Once I got out of high school, I knew I would have to get a job and take care of myself, and I wasn't used to that. So... My thing was, he has all this money. That's what I'm used to. I'm used to nice things. That's how he drew me in. Mm -hmm. He drew me in by buying me things, by spoiling me like my mother did. And it just went down from here. Once he, he took those things and he used those things to get me in, and once he got me in, it was just over from there. What is one of the most insensitive things that someone had said to either one of you guys about you, what you went through? That you're stupid, stupid or dumb. <laughs> And yeah. that I told you so. And that come from a that come from a person that's what close to you, right? Close mm -hmm. to you, and also they may be in an uh, abusive relationship themselves. I ask that question because this, uh, I I I get I personally get sick and tired of um, the hurt that people are causing one another. If we know, just like people look forward to Friday, for some reason when you when you're at work and Friday's coming, it's like it's like you didn't hit the the Powerball on a Friday, but so for that moment you're excited that it's Friday, but when you leave work and going home, you're back to face that home life that's just terrible. So what can you tell my listeners that's, that's helping you guys? I know the faith piece is important. I know talking to other people, I know sharing your story is important, but we all have a place in us that we still hope to not revisit those situations. Mm -hmm. So my question to you guys, what do you tell yourself to make sure that you don't revisit those type of situations? I know with me, I, like I said earlier, I speak those positive and daily affirmations over my life. You know, boosting my ego up, boosting my self-esteem up, telling myself that I'm more than enough and I'm worth it and I don't have to settle for, you know, certain things that most women settle for. So if, even if people can me and say she's conceited, I'm conceited. I'm not conceited, but you might look at me and think I'm conceited because I think highly of myself now. I remember when I didn't have any self-esteem at all. Mm -hmm. So I speak those affirmations over my life because it's easy to get drawn back in. You know, when you think you're when you think you love somebody, it's yeah. easy you know to fall back into that trap. So even now with uh, you know with situations that that I go through now, I still tell myself like I don't care what the situation is. I don't care if you have a million dollars. I'm not going to settle right. for the things that I used to settle for. So what? I speak those positive affirmations over my life. I think those are important and they really do work. So either one of you guys can answer this. What what was your scenario? Was it verbal abuse or was it actual physical abuse that you went through? Well, my abuse was all of the above. My <laughs> abuse was verbal, physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual. Okay. It was all those things. And um, what I do now for to not get into those types of relationship now is that now I recognize those red flags. Mm -hmm. So now I'm able to walk away because now I'm not afraid to be alone. Yeah, yeah. And I know that with this whole domestic violence thing is that most of the time I stayed in it is because I was trying to save him. Mm -hmm. And so now, now look, I'm no longer looking to save anyone. And I understand that I cannot save anyone. The people can only save themselves. So I'm just not afraid to walk away anymore. Walking, walking away is a ver and that's that's a very important topic because people have a fear of walking away, thinking 
worst case scenario. And I call it the unknown. We we spend a lot of time worrying about the unknown. With the unknown, it is what it is. It's unknown. Mm -hmm. But we don't put a lot of time and energy into the known. Mm -hmm. You deal with the known, but you're afraid of the unknown. Mm -hmm. Where the unknown has to be better than the known. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so it's like Absolutely. So we have to get we have to get people to the point of the lack of fear. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Bennett said it best. The lack of fear, but you have to put trust in something or someone. Mm -hmm. And we know we all know that prayer is top. It's top of the list. But we you everyone has to identify with someone that really has their back. And it's not gonna always be your girlfriend, it's not gonna always be a family member. But there's there's someone in our in our lives that we know for sure that has our back, and that's not the person that you talk to every day. Mm -hmm. It's that person that you know when you call, they're always there to listen. And they don't judge you. Absolutely. So we have to find a way to teach people on how to identify. And I guess they call it in, in the church. They call it armor bearer or something in the church world. Mm -hmm. That, those the ones that, that, that take care of the um, pastors. That take care of the pastors. Mm -hmm. So so I think civilians should have a person like that to help because that'll solve a lot of solutions for real mm -hmm. and you said it best the people that think they like you those are the main ones that go back and say man she she going through it i don't know why yeah. she went to do it in the first place yeah and they will leave you and abandon you and and that's and seeing one thing when you're dealing with domestic violence when you leave that victim abandoned in that situation you push them further into the situation mm -hmm. because they then they realize well i don't have anybody i don't, I I don't have no support i can't right. go home i don't have any friends so i have to stay here and that that that's that goes back to even our, our young kids when the, the the parents are pushing pushing them in the streets and a lot of them come from a place you come from, speaking about, you know, the parents would give them, give them, give them, give them, but they're not giving them love, they're not um, nourishing them. Mm -hmm. So they'll push them out of the street for advice. So that's the same thing with victims. You know, the people that they care about, if you're not actually giving them a hug or having reinforcing conversations, not going at them, not attacking a person, but just having conversation, mm -hmm. that helps a lot. But that, but that person is fearful of something themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So have you come to a have you you guys come to a point where you're actually talking to someone or they're trying to help you but you're seeing right through them saying that they're going through something worse than what you're going through? I think I've gone through so much that I'm able to identify, you know, right. certain things in people, and I know vice versa. People are, are able to, you know, identify things within me. But I have come in contact with people that, you know, having conversation with them, and I know that. Wow, they're in worse they're in a worse situation than I am. Right. And what and where did that put you guys? Cause because right now you both of you guys are advocates to to bring change. So is that a is that a good feeling to know that you've been through something and that you can help others, or does it make you revisit what you guys come through? It's a good Can't feeling for me. Yeah. yeah. It's a good thing for me to be able to use some to use my pain for my purpose. Okay. You know, I never thought that I, when I was in that that this would be my life journey until it happened to my daughter. And that's when God told me that I had to speak about it because when I got out of my domestic violence relationship, I thought it was over with. I didn't have to tell anybody mm -hmm. about it. I'm leaving this marriage. I'm good. Mm -hmm. And then 3 years old, my daughter was killed. And so that's when God said, you got to tell this story. You got to tell what happened to you. Because the way how I look at it is that my daughter had to grow up in that household watching that abuse. And so it sent her out to attract that same type of guy and wouldn't say anything. Wow. Because I didn't even know my daughter was in an abusive relationship until the day she died. And all of her friends had a story of abuse that she was going through. Wow. Well, we, we, wow. we got five minutes. So this, this, is, what I want, this is how I wanted to um, utilize those five minutes. And I'm gonna use the word regret because I don't right now I don't have another word to use, um, and I'm not saying it in a negative. What 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 do we what do you guys regret from your bad experiences? And if you had the opportunity to make the decision when it was going on, do you think now what you should have done? I, with me. And, you know, some people, and I say all the time, like a broken record, and people, some people might look at me like, this girl is crazy, but I don't regret anything that I've gone through. Okay. I feel like if I did not die in it, if I survived it, then I was, it was meant for me to go through it. Okay. And there's a greater purpose at the end of it. So I don't regret it, even though it was painful. I don't regret none of it. Okay. And if I could do it all over again, of course I would do it differently because I would know 
these certain signs. I would see certain things and I would do it differently. But because I've already gone through it and I know my purpose in life now, I don't regret it. Right. And for me, I regret staying too long. Okay. I feel as though that I stayed too long in the relationships because the first time I experienced domestic violence was at 16. And so it was like every relationship after that until the time I was 34, there was some different form of domestic violence going on. Mm -hmm. And so I really feel as though I regret not learning from the first situation mm -hmm. and thinking that these guys will get better when they kept showing me the same thing over and over and over again. Okay. Well, I'm going I'm to shoot my little jump shot. This, this, is for the, this is for the men that are here. Um, I pride myself on being a, a man that, um, you know, never, you know, cussed a female out or never actually put my hands on a woman. Um, there have been times <laughs> mm -hmm. that um, my buttons were pushed and I would think to do that, but what I what I do is always think about my mom first. I always think about if someone was to put their hand on my mom, how would I react to it? And this is the message I'm sending out to the guys. Before you call these ladies out of their name, before you put your hands on these ladies, before you just do anything, think about a female that's in your life that you love and care about dearly and actually put that person head on that person's body that you think about doing some harm to. And that would be one step to preventing domestic violence. What a lot of people, you always think before you do something, because that's how we build. You may, it may be a quick thought, mm -hmm. but before you react to something, you either say, the heck we're going to do it, or you'd be like, I'm not going to do it. But we have to come to a place where we know, I can't say this enough, we all know right from wrong. And I'm speaking to the guys now. You're not, it's, it's not a good look to call these ladies out their names. It's not a good look to put your hands on these females. It's just not good. There's nothing good can come out of it. The easiest trait to do is to just walk away. Mm -hmm. Our dudes out here cheating and doing wrong things anyway, so before you put your hands on a female, if you're going to go hang out doing something wrong, well, use that opportunity to go out and hang, do something wrong. I wait for you to be doing something wrong instead of abusing your wives or your girlfriends in the household. Mm -hmm. Come back home and let that be an argument. But don't physically hurt someone when you know you can just simply just walk away from the situation. And um, once again, I, I, I truly commend you. And, and I know you ladies are actually bringing change because I always say testimonies are the most powerful tool to help people to get through. I often say this. When, we go to, when, we, when people go to funerals, we mourn the death. You know, we're around family members, and then there's love at the repast. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of love and a lot. So we are built, and I want to say recover, but we are built to push through our worst situations. Mm -hmm. So we can't hold on to something negative all the time because now you're going against the grain. You have to stay prayed up. You have to stay respectful, and you have to love yourself. I just pe want people to love themselves. Absolutely. So in closing, ladies, we got a couple of minutes. Um, can you close out? We got one minute. So give me, give me, um, give me something. Well, I just want to say that if there is anybody out there that's going through domestic violence, that for them to reach out to the domestic violence hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. You can call that number throughout the United States and be able to have resources that can help you in any situation that you're going through. And to also just let them know that you are not alone and it's not your fault. I'm going to end the show with that. You are not alone, and it's not your fault. Thank you once again for tuning in to my show, The Archie Bezlow Show. Let's figure it out on WO 95.9 FM, 1450 AM. God loves you, and so do I. People, let's start loving one another like we're supposed to. See you next week. Thank you. All right, ladies. Huh? Your check. <laughs> My name is Jenny Allen, and I'm a mother, a writer, and a performer. Thanks for tuning in. I also survived uterine and ovarian cancers. I even wrote a play about that. Maybe you were just cancer-ish, and it'll pass. Before cancer, I took my health entirely. Like air, but my symptoms. Uh